Hello everybody and welcome to the latest episode of Timber Talks. I am today in a forest in Argyll, Scotland and we're going to be talking to of course Harry Stevens uh, to talk about this forest but also to talk to the senior forest manager Sam Bristow and to get some insights into the wildlife and also some of the site challenges as well. So we're in a forest in Mid Argyle that's managed by Till Hill. Um, and Sam's going to talk to us about some of the activities that we've got going on here. So, this is um, the site we're on now was felled in 2021. Um, it's uh, currently has been restocked. So, it's restocked in 2022 uh, with the initial planting. And we've had one beat up since then. Um, Plates so of when we're saying beat up, which so is where we're replacing, replacing the, the stock that has failed in the first year in this instance. So if a tree, we plant the trees initially and during the whole restocking process. Um, if a tree fails, for so for the example in here, we had um, we can have weevil damage. So if the weevils have girdled the tree, so they've caused the the, the tree to be able to not transmit uh, water and nutrients up the stem by removing the cambium um, layer, then that will cause the tree to fail. Steve's got a good example of a weevil just there. So it's a, it's a sort of a small hard shell bug in effect. Um, and it, what it does is it strips that cambium layer, which causes the, the fatality or can cause the fatality of the tree if the weevil loads to high enough. That would be one of the greatest management issues that we have on these sites. Weevils is one of the hardest things to manage. So weevils primarily breed in de dead stumps. So they'll breed under the surface, generally in the, between the soil and the roots. Um, and in there they'll breed, they lay the larvae, and now what happens is they all come out at sort of specific times of year. So what they do is they break, they, they emerge, and we have sort of two emergencies a year generally, um, but it can be three, two to three emergencies a year, and that will then cause, um, so basically they'll all come out at once and start eating your trees because they're looking for dinner. Um, other issues in here would be frost damage. So we had quite a severe frost, and we've had trees started to grow, and they're nice and soft and quite vulnerable and the frost has hit them quite hard and killed them unfortunately. Over, so this site was was trench bounded by one of our local contractors so the, the site came through so the track on the brash mat which has been left after the harvesting um, try and manage the brash to a certain level and then make individual mounds as you can see lying around us to about two seven hundred stem uh, two seven hundred mounds per hectare. So we're trying to improve the planting position yeah, trying so to create a microsite that's that's got a bit of soil aeration, mixing soil horizons. Yeah, so we try. So it's, it's, so number one, it's about it's, we we say in our office, if you get the mounding right, you get everything else right. Everything else follows in quite nicely. So if we get it to two seven hundred stems a hectare, we get the drainage through the ground preparation. We get the mounding site, so you can see every sort of roughly one point eight, one point nine meters, there'll be an individual mound. Um, and what it does is it means that when our planters come through, they know exactly where they're going. It makes a nice position for the for the for the trees to be to be put themselves in, and then it means that everything kind of falls on quite well going forward. And it strikes me here that we're seeing a contrast here. So behind us, we've got more peaty soil, and then moving up that way, we've got more mineral mineral soil. So it, it really encapsulates the the challenge or the inconsistency or the the complexity of these, these sites. Oh yeah, unfortunately with the with the base or the base geology that we've got, you can go from quite literally a flat, boggy area where peat has accumulated and built up over years, all the way onto sort of exposed rock and completely skeletal soils. Um, so it really is a challenge to Argyle has quite a unique um, soil soil structure comparatively to some other parts of the world. And if we think about things at a forest level. Describe some of the things we're doing, planning um, at many levels. You know, talk, talk a bit about that. So, so, the, the, so for the forest, so say initially there's just millions of trees here after being planted. Um, what we'd look to do is try and produce a long-term forest plan, which would then give us the felling permission by Scottish Forestry, so allow us to legally fell the timber. We'll then come through, we'll sell the, the timber to a, typically our our agent in this instance would sell the timber to a merchant, so which could be example Till Hill Harvesting. They would buy the timber, fell it, um, fell it, at, at, uh, we would set, call it a standing sale. So the trees are stand, stand, standing and we sell it there. So they'd come through, harvest the site. The forest management staff would supervise that from a 
representing the landowner, ensuring that it's been done to a standard that we see as fit. Um, and then once that's been completed, it'll then be handed back to the to the to other forest management staff. Once we've completed that, we'll come through and we'll ground prep the site. So that means making our mounds, as we just discussed, draining the site where required, managing the brash um, onto then, and after that, we're then restocking. So all these trees would have, it's all this, so it's about 14.19 hectares, this site specifically. So we planted six spruce for the whole site. Over about two or three years, we'll beat up, which is replacing the, the tree that has died. Um, and at that point in time, we should be seeing the, the trees up to sort of sort of man height and ready to go. And we've got the crop away, as we would yeah, call it. Yeah, got it the then crop needs away. minimal intervention. At that Ideally, point. yeah, we would we would look to, to do minimal intervention. There might be some in crop drainage, maybe about year twenty to year thirty, before the trees are are sort of ready to be harvested again. But really, that's the idea: is to try and get them to a point after about five years of intervention that they're on their own and they're, they're like the trees behind us, growing away quite happily. So there's three red deer over there. Uh, it'd be interesting to know what other sort of uh, wildlife diversity that we've got on site. We've got a mixture of, well, sort of wildlife that we want to go, well, let's say, encourage as such. So there's a note of white-tailed eagles quite often. So we, we believe they've got a position in the forest they're nesting, but we've just never found it. Right. Um, they're normally too well hidden away, so they might find a wee bit of windblow in the middle of a crop somewhere where we can't access and um, they might be nesting there, but so we've got the white-tailed eagles. There's records of hen harriers in the forest. So we had, in some of the younger restock, like behind us there, when it was younger, so maybe when it was only sort of maybe a metre high, the, the hen harriers would be using it as a nesting territory. Um, and so they were breeding inside the restock. And what they would then do is they'd braise their young and then they'd disperse from there. But then they'd come back in another restock in a following year. And we've actually, So they'll move around as the restock moves around? Basically, they'll chase the restock to a point where it's like the sort of suitable habitat for them. Right. So we don't have a big fox present on site. So actually that encourages the ground nesting birds right. on the whole. We don't control the foxes. We have no interest in controlling the foxes because they produce the, the vole load. But we just don't seem to get many foxes on the on this property. And do we get golden eagles here? We have golden eagles in the neighbouring estate, so right. which use the which have used the forest for transiting across. Right. Um, we've never seen them hunting on the forest, um, but they definitely use the forest as a transiting point. So they're they're to the south of the forest, um, and they they nest on the crags and the cliffs oh, over yeah, there. Yeah, classic. Um, one of the one of the, the the wildlife issues we have is really red deer. We just saw three heading over in that direction just a moment ago. Um, so we, we, we have to manage the deer in the forest to ensure that they're not causing damage to the sort of the young, the young restock crops. So for example, where you've got a tree like this in front of us, a deer during sort of pre periods of poor weather might, might have very little cover on the floor and then nip the top of the tree as a sort of a last a last sort of chance of trying to get nutrition for the year. So they don't want to preference Sitka spruce ideally, but they might have to choose to when there's periods of snow. So what we do in here is we employ a controller, um, a private individual who comes out and they basically are paid a, a fee to shoot per head. Um, and then they use that meat, the, they, they sell the venison as a sustainable and ethical meat. Uh, into the into the market and indeed if we didn't do that we'd we'd, we'd be having starving we'd have, yeah so so if you don't manage the the deer population in britain nowadays we have quite ethical issues in the sense of they, they there's just too many of them they'll breed too too greatly they'll get trapped on the hills during the winter when the snow comes down and they'll starve to death um, so actually shooting isn't a bad thing controlling the population is very important and from our perspective, we want to try and control them to reduce our damage, but it also it comes back into the fact that we're not having overly large deer populations, which can't be supported by the land naturally.